The gates and doors were barred and all the windows fastened down. I spent the night in sleeplessness and arose at every sound. Half in hopeless sorrow and half in fear the day would find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away. Then just before the sunrise I heard something at the wall. They began to rattle and a voice began to call. I hurried to the window, looked down into the street, beckoning swords and torches, and the sound of soldiers' feet. There was no one there but Mary, so I went down to let her in. John stood there beside me as she told us where she'd been. She said they'd moved him in the night and none of us knows where. The stone's been rolled away and now his body isn't there. We both ran toward the garden, then John ran on ahead. We found the stone and the empty tomb just the way the very said. But the winding sheet they'd wrapped him in was just an empty shell. How or where they'd taken him was more than I could tell. Oh, something strange had happened there, just what I did not know. John believed a miracle, but I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high Cause I'd seen them crucify him Then I saw him die Back inside the house again The guilt and anguish came Everything I'd promised him Just added to my shame when at last it came to choices, I denied I knew his name. And even if he was alive, it wouldn't be the same. Then suddenly the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume. Light shone from everywhere, drove shadows from the room. And Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide. And I fell down on my knees and I just clung to him and cried. Then he raised me to my feet and as I looked into his eyes, the love was shining out from him like sunlight from the skies. Guilt in my confusion disappeared into me. But the fear I'd ever had just melted into me.
Good morning, church. <laughs> He's risen. He's alive. Wow. Wow. Becky's husband this morning brought us a little treat. And uh, my, what a song and what a job she did. And we thank her for that this morning. Um, I, I hope you have your Bibles with you. We got a late start. We had some technical difficulty. Uh, Satan's that way. He, he would just like to shut us down today. But he's not going to shut us down because he's alive. He's risen and he's coming again. This morning's message, uh, I tell you what, I, I've prayed over this thing. And I've prayed for the listeners watching it and listening to it. And, and as Christians today, I, I want you to be praying for this message. Even as I preach, uh, it's a lengthy message. Go ahead and sit down and get comfortable. Um, it's more than, than 20, 30 minutes, okay? I'll just warn you that up front. But there's so much in this message. Uh, it, it ties the Old Testament to the New Testament. It ties the Gospels with the Epistles. It, it, it ties everything together. We'll be in several books uh, of the Bible. A lot of scripture this morning. Um, but the message, the message is just, it's, it's for those that are lost those that are, need to make a decision, it, it, it's, it's for everyone. It'll bring you back uh, to parts of the Bible that possibly you've read and didn't understand. It's going to bring you back and it's going to tie scriptures together that you may not have thought went together. Buckle up. Hang on. We're going to get into it. Uh, right after we pray, and we do, we we thank God for this Resurrection Sunday. We thank God that uh, His Son came. He died. He was buried. But as they've been saying all week, Sunday's coming. Sunday's here, folks, and He's there. He's at the right hand of God the Father, and He's coming again. Let's pray, Father in heaven. We come to Thee now through the blood of Jesus Christ, as we humbly know how, Father. We come before thy throne, thanking thee for this day, for the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercy. We thank you for the plan of salvation today. God, we just thank you for all the blessings of life. We thank you for the song this morning and how it touched our hearts and prepared our, our hearts for this message. Father, be in this message this morning. God, may it go forth and, and uh, claim lives for Jesus Christ. And we'll give thee all the praise, glory, and honor for it. For it's in Christ's name. And for his sake we pray. Amen and amen. I'm glad you're here today. But you didn't really have a choice. For you see, you are here by divine appointment. You are at this particular place, at this particular time, for this particular message. So sit back, get comfortable, follow along in your Bible, and hang on every word that you will hear today. It could possibly change your life. You will be in the, uh, we will be in the books of uh, Luke, John, Ephesians, and Hebrews. And we'll be talking of Jesus and a couple of criminals, Mary Magdalene, a couple of angels, Thomas, Abraham, a rich man and a beggar. We will be visiting Golgotha, the tomb, Sheol, and the upper room. All of today's message, of course, centers around the first Easter. Today's message is entitled, If You're Not Right, You'll Be Left. In the days, in, in days of the New Testament, when they were written, the practice of crucifixion needed no explanation. In many generations since then, most people do not appreciate what a person experienced in the ordeal of execution by crucifixion. Although the Romans did not invent crucifixion, they perfected it as a form of torture and capital punishment that was designed to produce a slow death with maximum pain and suffering. The combination of scourging and crucifixion made death on the cross especially brutal. 
the victim's back was first torn open by the scourging. Then the clotting blood was ripped open again when the clothes were torn off before crucifixion. The victim was thrown on the ground to fix his hands to the crossbeam, and the wounds on his back were again torn open and contaminated with dirt. Then as the victim hung on the cross, each breath caused the painful wounds on the back to scrape against the rough wood of the upright beam. When the nail was driven through the wrists, it severed the large median uh, nerve. This stimulated nerve produced excruciating bolts of fiery pain in both arms and often gave the victim a claw-like grip in the hands. Beyond the extreme pain, the major effect of crucifixion was to restrict normal breathing. The weight of the body pulling down on the arms and shoulders, tending to fix the respiratory muscles in an inhalation state and hinder exhalation. The lack of adequate respiration resulted in several muscle cramps, which further hindered breathing. To get a good breath, the victim had to push against the feet and flex the elbows, pulling from the shoulders. Putting the weight of the body on on the feet produced searing pain, and flexing of the elbows twisted the hands hanging on the nails. Lifting the body for a breath also painfully scraped the back against the rough wooden post. Each effort to get a proper breath was agonizing, exhausting, and led to a sooner death. Not uncommonly, insects would light upon and burrow into the open wounds or the eyes, ears, and nose of the dying and helpless victim and birds of prey would tear at these sights. Moreover, it was customary to leave the corpse on the cross to be devoured by predatory animals. Death from crucifixion could come from many sources, acute shock from blood loss, being too exhausted to breathe any longer, dehydration, stress-induced heart attack, or congestive heart failure leading to a cardiac rupture. If the victim did not die quickly enough, the legs were broken, and the victim was soon unable to breathe because of the posture of the crucified person. How bad was crucifixion? We get our English word excruciating from the Roman word that means out of the cross. Consider how heinous sin must be in the sight of God when it requires such a sacrifice. Luke chapter 23, verses 32 and 33. Remember the the message today, if you're not right, you'll be left. Luke 23, 32 and 33 says, And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. They were, they, there, they crucified him. The most significant thing about Jesus' suffering was that he was not in any sense the victim of circumstances. He was in control. Jesus said of his life in John 10, 18, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. It is terrible to be forced to endure such torture, but to freely choose it out of love is remarkable. The malefactor criminals, one on the right hand, the other on the left. In his death, Jesus was identified with sinners. 
he was crucified between two criminals. Luke 23, 39, uh, starting at verse 39, says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. Verse 42 goes on and says, And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Verse 39, one of the criminals crucified with Jesus joined in the mockery and scorn. He reasoned that if Jesus were the Messiah, he should have uh, saved. He should have saved, saved those who are being crucified with him. Verse forty says, "But the other, answering, rebuked him." Both Matthew and Mark uh, indicate that at first both criminals mocked Jesus. In the hours spent on the cross, one of the criminals came to see things differently and to put his trust in Jesus. The criminal on the right respected God. He asked, Dost thou not fear God? The criminal on the right knew his own sin. He said, In the same condemnation. He said, We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. The criminal on the right knew Jesus. This man has done nothing wrong, he said. The criminal on the right called out to Jesus where he said, he said unto Jesus. The criminal on the right called out to Jesus as Lord. He said to Jesus, Lord. The criminal on the right believed Jesus was who Jesus said he was. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The criminal on the right believed the promise of everlasting life from Jesus. Jesus answered, the trust of the criminal on the right, assuring him that his life after death would be with Jesus and be in paradise, not torment. Which brings us to paradise. Where is this place called paradise? The place of paradise is related to us in the story of the rich man and the beggar. This is found in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. We were in Luke 23, so just go back a few chapters. Luke chapter 16 and verse 19 we'll start. Luke 16, 19 says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, Thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, 
so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So back to our story in Luke 23, 43. Luke 23, 43, Jesus tells the malefactor, remember it, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So when was this trip? Let's go to John chapter 20. I told you we're going to be all over the place today. So have those Bibles, have those uh, uh, e-Bibles in your lap, and let's look at the scripture. John chapter 20. John chapter 20, going to verse 11. John chapter 20, verse 11 says, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she said the and when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Verse 15 Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabbani, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that she had spoken these things and that he had spoken these things unto her. Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. Peter and John examined the evidence of the empty tomb and John was persuaded that Jesus rose from the dead, though it did not, he did not understand the meaning of it all. Mary did not yet have the confidence that Jesus was resurrected, so she wept. As she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. Mary wanted to see what Peter and John saw, so she made her own examination. Yet in the moment between their examination and Mary's, something was different in the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting. Mary didn't notice the burial wrappings and their curious arrangement. Now there were two angels in the tomb. Mary didn't seem to react with shock or fear. She probably did not immediately perceive that they were angels. Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Jesus did not immediately reveal himself to Mary. It wasn't to play some trick on her. It was to break through her unbelief and forgetfulness of Jesus' promise of resurrection. Jesus said unto her, Mary. Jesus had only to say one word, and all was explained. She heard in the name and the tone of the voice of her love, beloved Messiah and instantly called him Rabbinah. Then he says, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my father. She was not allowed to touch him. 
because he had not yet fully resurrected to heaven. Turn with me now to the book of Ephesians. We're going to see a lot of scripture and how these scriptures are tied together to this morning. Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going. I'll give you a moment. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also which ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Notice the ascending and descending, speaking of Christ, and the phrase, led captivity captive. The ones that were captive were the Old Testament saints who died in faith, believing that Christ was coming to take away the sin debt of the world. They could not go to heaven until that sin debt was paid in full. Jesus paid it all. Therefore, he descended into Sheol, or Hades, the lowest part of the earth, and took those captives, which were on the paradise side of Sheol, with him into heaven. The malefactor, remember, the one on the right, He said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The malefactor also made the trip. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 and 40. I'll read these to you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. John 20, verse 16 and 17 says, Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself, and saith unto him, Rabbani, which is to say, Master. Verse 17 again, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, touch me not, For I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Verse 27 of John chapter 20. 27 through 29. John 20, verse 27 through 29. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Mary wasn't allowed to touch Christ when she saw him at the tomb, because he had not yet ascended to the Father. But now Thomas was told he could feel the nail prints and thrust his hand into his side. What was different? What happened between the time that Mary saw Jesus at the tomb and then he appeared to Thomas and the others in the upper room? When Jesus resurrected from the dead, He went to Sheol, the lowest parts of the earth, and gathered to himself all the Old Testament saints that were held captive and took them with him as he ascended to heaven. Let's finish this. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse... uh, We'll start reading at verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, 
but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices of sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Verse 8, Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst, hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Verse 10, By the which we uh, will we all, excuse me, by the which will we are, by the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, verse 20, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, which is to say his flesh. The veil of the temple, folks, is gone. There is no need for the priests anymore. And continual sacrifice is now a thing of the past. Jesus died once for all. Now to access the throne room of God, we simply go through the new veil, that is to say, his flesh, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, verses 21 through 24. Hebrews 9, verse 21 says, Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. You say, Pastor, what does all this mean to me? Well, if you're a Christian, you have a great high priest that sits at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for you. You have the eternal hope of heaven waiting for you when you die. And you have a never-ending source of strength in the person of the Holy Spirit that indwells you and keeps you. But what about me, Pastor? One who has never accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. How does this affect me? It has shown you that what Christ went through for you and hopefully made you realize that you cannot enter heaven without first accepting what Christ did at Calvary, dying for your sins, and believe in your heart 
that Jesus bodily resurrected from the dead. If you confess your sins to him and ask Jesus to come into your heart and save you, you too will have that home in heaven when you die. So here's your opportunity to make things right between you and God. Remember, if you're not right, you'll be left. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, a serious message, a message, God, that shows you were in everything and you're still in all things. A message, God, that shows a supreme sacrifice was given. A once and for all sacrifice that ended all sacrifices. God, we saw scripture today that left not Abraham and Moses and Jacob and Isaac and all the rest. Didn't leave the beggar. Didn't leave, didn't leave the malefactor who hung on the right. Christ took them all as he ascended into heaven. He also took that blood with him that was shed at Calvary. That blood that was a supreme sacrifice. He took that blood and he, and he sprinkled it on the mercy seat. Where is that mercy seat? It's in heaven. It's where he sits today at the right hand of God the Father. Making intercession for us. Oh God, may, may folks get a hold of this message. May they see when Christ hung on the cross and he took the sin of the world, he took those beatings and scourgings and he hung there and bled and died. Right before he died, he said, it is finished. It's finished. It's all over. What he was talking about was everything in the past, all of those blood sacrifices that where you had to go to the priest and, and offer up sacrifices of blood to cover the sin of, uh, of, of, the, of you and uh, your family and the, and the nation and, and the world. No more. Christ said it's finished. He died once and for all. His blood is sufficient. His blood was the propitiation that God the Father needed. It was that which satisfied the Father. It was, it was unblemished, unmarked. It was sinless. He was born of a virgin for that very reason. He did not sin once while he walked this earth. And he went and he died on Calvary, an innocent man, for the sins of the guilty. Oh, Father in heaven. If there be one out there this morning that does not know Jesus Christ in that relationship, may this be the morning, Lord. What a great and glorious morning, a resurrection Sunday. May they bow their head now, accept Jesus Christ into their heart and their life, confess their sin and believe that he did die for them and he did raise again the third day and he is sitting at the right hand of you, our Father in heaven making intercession for us. Oh, Father, we, we thank you for the plan of salvation. We thank you for this opportunity. And we thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, be with that one this morning. Help them right now to confess their sin and accept you as their Savior. In Jesus' name, and amen. As we close out today's message, I, I just want to thank you, Lord, uh, for, for all those that uh, joined us. Go back through the scriptures. Uh, I, I hope you jotted down some notes. Um, I, I hope you'll, you'll uh, pray over this message. You'll look at it again. You'll, you'll play it over and over if you have to. Get a hold of this. Know that Jesus Christ died for you. That blood was shed for you. And there's a home in heaven for you. I pray this morning, this Easter morning, that you'll pray for all your loved ones. Take this message. It'll be on YouTube later and on Facebook. Take it and share it. Uh, send the link to others. 
not that it may blow up Facebook, but this message, I believe, is important. Because if you're not right, you will be left. That malefactor that hung on the right, he confessed that Jesus was the Lord. And Jesus told him, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I believe he took him right on to Sheol with him when he led captivity captive. And I think he took him right on into heaven when he ascended on high on uh, into the throne room of God. I believe one day we'll meet that malefactor that hung on the right. As for the other one, the one that rejected Christ there on the cross, uh, he wanted he thought nothing of Christ, only himself. He wanted himself to be save us from all this, from, from everything that we're going through now. It's all about him. Is it all about you this morning? I'll tell you where that malefactor, the one on the left, I'll tell you where he's at this morning. He also went and descended into the lower parts of the earth. But he's on the torment side of hell. He's in torment now, just as the rich man is. Being in flames, he lifted up his eyes being in torments, and he's crying out to God for forgiveness. But God won't hear him. Once your decision's made and you die, it's been made forever, and death seals that decision. I pray this morning that you'll have time and opportunity to ask Christ to come into your heart and your life and save you. May you all have a blessed Easter. May you enjoy your day. And may you give glory and honor to God our Father. Thank you for joining us. God bless you.